So we welcome uh, Professor Jeffrey Ozen from the University of Toronto to speak on uh, matters that matter to all of us, whether we're scientists or not, engineers or not. Um, I'm Alan Shepard, I'm the president of Concordia University. Just to say that for a very long time now, sustainability and issues of the environment have been at the heart of education here at the university, driven probably primarily by our students in the first instance. And, uh, and with a lot of work going on now in various departments on this campus and Loyola. So uh, we're really pleased you're here with us this evening for the stimulating talk that we're expecting. And I've just uh, gotten a precy of the talk from uh, Professor Ozen, and uh, I think we're in for a treat, a very energetic treat. Uh, I want to start by um, saying thank you to NSERC as part of the Science Odyssey program, helping uh, fund this evening's talk, and, uh, and give my congratulations to all of the Concordia staff and faculty who've been instrumental in making the uh, Science Odyssey project uh, go forward. And I wanted to welcome now uh, Robert Desiel, uh, who is the Quebec delegate uh, to NSERC, to say a few words of welcome. Mr. Desiel. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Yes, I will say just a few words. So thank you, Mr. Shepard, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. So I'm very delighted to be here at Concordia University today for its first annual Science Odyssey campaign. And thank you, Professor Ozen, for accepting the invitation. This is a very important event for us. And thank you to all the organizers here at Concordia. And a spe special thank to all the uh, students that has been involved in the organization. Too. This is great. Thumbs up for all the students. So, organisé par le CRSNG, l'Odyssée des sciences montre de quelle façon les découvertes et les innovations transforment la vie des gens et contribuent à la création d'une solide culture scientifique au Canada. Lors de son lancement, en 2016, pour la première édition, il y a eu au-dessus de 600 activités organisées partout au travers le Canada, et ça dans plus de 200 villes, et heureusement, on a eu l'aide aussi de 340 partenaires pour nous aider à faire tout ça. Science Odyssey consists of 10 days of showcasing and celebrating discovery and innovation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics through hundreds of events and activities across Canada. And here at Concordia, you are bringing the art into the mix, turning STEM into STEAM. And this is, this is great because, as you may know, you know, uh, just an example, I think it's great merging art and uh, STEM and technology, science, and mathematics. Is you, you all know the Apple's product, and they are a perfect example of a blend of art and technology. That was the vision of Steve Jobs, and nowadays we see more, more of that, you know, making appliance and product that combine technology and art. I think it's a great initiative. A science policy presents a unique opportunity to make Canadians of all ages aware of Canadian achievement and learn how they impact our day-to-day -day life. And obviously, the ultimate goal of this uh, event is to foster a strong science culture in Canada. Au nom du CRSNG, je vous souhaite tous de vivre une merveilleuse odyssée pendant les dix prochaines journées. Merci. Good evening. I'm Christine DeWolf. I'm the chair of chemistry and biochemistry here at Concordia and co-director of the Concordia Center for Nanoscience Research. It is a great honor for Concordia to welcome Professor Jeffrey Ozen from the University of Toronto to give the keynote address to open Concordia's Science Odyssey. Jeffrey Ozen is known as the father of nanochemistry, a field he pioneered with landmark achievements in all aspects of nanomaterials, from their synthesis and design to understanding fundamental structure property relationships through both theory and experiment and realizing their application as advanced materials. In 1992, he proposed that nanoscale building blocks can be designed to self-assemble into structures with organization across all the length scales, a visionary concept that we now take for granted. He has become a global leader in nanochemistry research and education, but also innovation with commercialized inventions such as photonic and elastic inks. In fact, he is the co-founder of two scientific startup companies with a third company, Art Nano Innovations, that expands beyond the walls of science, exploring the synergies of science and the arts. Currently, he is at the University of Toronto and holds the prestigious rank of Distinguished University Professor and is a Canada Research Chair in Materials Chemistry. His accolades are numerous, and some of his most prestigious career awards include the Canadian Society of Chemistry Stacey Award, as well as the Pure and Applied Inorganic Chemistry Award, the Royal Society of Chemistry Great Britain Award in Materials Chemistry, 
the Chemical Institute of Canada medal, the Rutherford Memorial Medal in Chemistry from the Royal Society of Canada, the Alcan Award for Inorganic Chemistry from the Chemical Institute of Canada, the Koblenz Memorial Prize for Molecular Spectroscopy from the American Spe Spectroscopy Society, the Medolla Medal in Physical Inorganic Chemistry from the Royal Institute of Chemistry, and the World Cultural Council 2011 Albert Einstein Prize. He's also received three University of Toronto Connaught Awards targeted to transformative research by top-ranked scientists. He focuses on the green and environmentally responsible development of advanced and functional materials that can benefit mankind. And with that in mind, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Ozen to present his lecture entitled, Jar of Fears, Do We Fight CO2 or Embrace It? Welcome. Thank you very much for trying to live up to it. Um, I'd like to thank the students, um, of course, who is this okay, this uh, thing? It's working right? Um, I'd like to thank all the students who helped organize this. Uh, we just had a symposium that I'll mention to you in Toronto, and they did a fantastic job, and I'm, I'm sure your students have done a fantastic job too. And of course, I, I thank um, everyone down from uh, the president down to NSERC, of course, our best friends. <laughs> 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 and the dean and the chair lady. And so, so we're going to have some fun, okay? Um, so this is actually uh, part of the Art Nano Innovation uh, company that I started with a very famous American art a sort of graphic illustrator, neuropsychologist, um, MIT um, Media Lab person. Uh, called Todd Seiler, who came out of the same Ronald Feldman Fine Arts Gallery um, in Soho, where Andy Warhol type people came out. So I went from like no art to the absolute tops. And um, I met him in Estonia when he won the Leonardo da Vinci Prize, I went, won the, uh, the Albert Einstein, we got stuck. And so we started resonating together as I listened to how he took complex ideas in um, science and medicine and engineering into the abstract art world. And so he got extremely excited about the nano world and got involved in this epic journey, which as you know, uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey and uh, Odysseus uh, went on this epic journey after the, um, the 10 years uh, that he spent in Troy fighting the Trojan Wars. Um, and you probably don't know that Ossesis, Ossesis is his name, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Does anyone know what it means in English? Trouble. <laughs> and I'm going to cause some trouble. Um, so yeah, he went on an epic journey. Um, and he left his wife and uh, son behind. And they basically screwed away his money in the palace and she had 106 suitors I think and there's all sorts of stuff going on there as they sort of spent all the money and basically had a good time and then he came back um, but coming back took him 10 years and it was an epic journey and we're on an epic journey that's for sure and so I, I actually I don't know if it was intentional to choose that name um, but I really do think the troubles that he had which were unbelievable are the types of troubles that we are facing dealing with this energy transition. And the first one took 100 years, from 1740 to 1860, if I got my numbers right, to build the infrastructure on going from basically us, the machine, to fossil-driven machines. And now we're moving into renewable energy and so forth. Uh, not fast enough, it would seem. So it, it's an interesting story, the Odyssey story, in terms of what he had to deal with. And I want to sort of tell you some of the things we have to deal with as well. So that's the connection. And the fact is, you know, not many people really understand greenhouse gas, the effect, climate change, global warming. You know, you mention it and they sort of switch off. The sky's blue, everything looks fine, uh, and so forth. Uh, but we've had five extinctions in the last 400 million years. Of 
caused by natural causes, uh, but it was always temperature rise that caused mass extinctions. And if you're religious, of course, only God can eliminate life on Earth. But there's a very good chance that we could actually eliminate life on Earth. In the last hundred, um, last hundred years, we've managed to kill 230 million people in various genocides and wars. So we're sort of good at killing, <laughs> that's for sure. So, um, so this is going to be the story. Um, so there's a lot of angst, a lot of anxiety in this jar, if you sort of think about it. And, um, you know, um, our generation, of course, you know, created more or less everything we have today. And now we have the millennials who have to live with this. And um, I hope, for those of you who don't know this story, and it's taken me a long time to get this story, but it's a good time in my life to do it before I become carbon dioxide. So let's have some fun. So there I am, back in the U. I'm sort of embarrassed to be English these days. Um, and when I go to Germany, I'm going to be Canadian. <laughs> um, but for those kids here and others, uh, back in the UK, when I came, I was born during the war with bombs dropping in central London. That's why I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, Sputnik went up. And we all went into science and technology. And amazing things were happening, lasers, DNA, computers. I was really good at math. They said to me, you should do math. I said, how do you make money in math? No one said computers. <laughs> so we went into science. And then, um, whoops, come back. So I want you to know the story. It's an interesting story. And it will relate to why I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is um, we were all destroyed in Europe, right? Canada, more or less, didn't suffer that. And America didn't. And so I was brought up in a reconstruction period, you know, with rations and all of that. And it was quite nice. We were very social. We helped each other a lot. Not like today, back there. Um, and all my friends got jobs as the university expanded. And they say, don't worry, you're a bright guy. You'll get a job. And for some reason, I can't explain, I wanted to be a professor. And then all the doors closed in the UK. Don't worry, you'll be fine. I'm starving on 300 pounds a year with a baby. So I went to my boss, and I said to him, Canada, Commonwealth, right? Same as England, right? I said, what about Canada? And he said, Canada? Canada? It's a backwater. And it sort of was when I arrived. It was sort of like that. There wasn't that much science. So I arrived in those days when you could be hippies. And then I moved into, so I was a professor at 25. I went into my first lecture, sat at the back shaking. And I walked down. And the student said, sit down. The professor's coming. I said, I am the professor. So I grew a beard. And I became the professor. And that was my. Charles Manson period, <laughs> or Rasputin. And so I was brought up on a beach in Brighton. So I'm a beachcomber. So you know I like to invent stuff and then move on. Nobody knew what I was. I fell in the cracks before the word interdisciplinarity. Uh, and I created the materials program and the interdisciplinary program and so forth. Um, and then I went into my Steven Spielberg phase. <laughs> And then I sort of became, I moved into my sort of senior citizen phase when I thought I was going to be forced to retire. And it, it wasn't sort of um, a backwater anymore. It was a world-class city. And I've had the greatest career that I can tell you. Canada is a fantastic place to allow you to be as free as a bird. And we have to be as free as a bird in order to compete with the rest of the world. So we, we need that here very much, Mr. NSERC, right? Um, <laughs> but we also do need to be able to take things into the marketplace, uh, which is uh, your job these days. So I wasn't forced to retire. And the question is, what am I going to do as a senior scientist? <laughs> it, 
had to be something crazy. So basically, I decided we're all in this world together. We must now shoulder this Herculean responsibility of caring for the Earth with the same degree of concern as we care for ourselves and our collective future. We have a very serious problem. It's the grandest challenge ever facing humanity today. It's beyond the Manhattan Project. It's beyond cancer. I mean, you know, so people would die. You know, but not the whole life system and so forth, which is a possibility if we go business as usual. So fortunately, we have a minister who does care. Uh, his name is Glenn Murray. And he's a bit of a rock star these days. Everyone wants to invite him to talk about uh, the Ontario Climate Change Plan and how he is supporting uh, this transition this energy transition and so forth. Um, and we just had the, the CO2 Woodstock, as I call it, and these are some of the absolute best in the field. But they're not just chemists who make stuff and sort of do chemistry with CO2. In here are people who do climate economics. In here are people who do life cycle analyses in terms of cradle to grave. You're not going to sort of get an industry involved unless there's a business model there. There are no altruistic managers. They lose their jobs if they don't keep their shareholders happy. And in here are mainly engineers. Uh, there's the odd chemist. Um, and they cover the, the full spectrum. And this really was a fantastic meeting. So uh, what's this all about? So basically, this was the symposium. These were so the speakers. And this is our challenge, right? Which is you can talk about climate change, and you're going to sort of do something to sort of curb the production of CO2. But it's avoided carbon that counts. And it's really the energy flows, the economic flows, the material flows, and all of these things that you have to take into account. So. There are a lot of people who see money in this field, and all of a sudden they're CO2 experts. Beware. So that's why I'm sort of youngish. I mean, you've got to be inside a 74-year-old body to know what, what energy and young feels like. But fortunately, I'm, I'm still able uh, to um, work with these people who don't talk about hip joints and diabetes and Alzheimer's and dementia and funerals. They're all young and excited, and every door is open for them. So they keep me young. Thank you very much, Toronto. So basically, this is one of the things that got me going and got me thinking. Uh, Canada should celebrate its inventions and its contributions to the world. And one of the greatest ones was we've saved hundreds of millions of lives with the discovery of insulin and the award of a Nobel Prize. And in the uh, Connaught Laboratory that produced uh, insulin, and I can't remember how much is in the fund, $150 million, that money is used at the University of Toronto to fund grand challenges, for example. So there are 3,000 faculty, and they all can go for it. And we were lucky enough to win this uh, based on our, um, on, our, on our work that I'm going to talk about. And it's sort of curious that this saved hundreds of millions of lives, and we might contribute to be able to saving hundreds of millions of lives. Except it's a greater challenge, I think, than, in, than diabetes. Um, that's my hero. He championed my work. I would not be here today if he did not, in an unconventional way, say that, yeah, somebody should be working on this problem in a serious mode. And um, basically, he was uh, the driving force between us um, uh, going from ground zero in this field um, a few years ago. And I, I'm a materials laboratory. And it's um, what I'm going to try and convince you. It's a materials problem. And he wants Ontario to be a world leader in all of this. 
um, and they partner with Quebec in Ontario and, and uh, California. And so that's a large population on the same page. And they partner with a lot of other places like Germany, southern Germany. Um, and so um, we want to be part of this uh, revolution. And actually, Canada is a great place because we've got something like 198 languages, I think, in Toronto. So we're all in it together, and we know how to make it work. right? We're one of the few liberal democracies left in the world. right? Um, and we're all in this together. So we're actually the right country to be a, a sort of a focus, you know, a hub for research in this area. And Toronto is now officially a sustainability university and one of the largest polluters in the city. So they're a good partner to supply me with CO2. <laughs> So this is the challenge, right? So I was born at this time, in, and um, everything was 280 parts per million. And now we've gone above this, this point of 406. At 450, you get neurological problems. Already, we get what is called clear sky turbulence, and you're beginning to see lots of people smashed to pieces in planes. Right, because the density gradient from the equator to the poles has changed as a result of the CO2. The jet streams have changed, and there's a lot more turbulence that you can't see. It's called clear sky turbulence. Now, these are things I mention because you don't know about them. Okay? I mean, you know about you know, maybe the water will rise, the ice caps will melt, the permafrost will deliver a trillion tons of methane, and that's goodbye, everybody. And a paper came out recently that showed it's happening already. The permafrost is, the methane is uh, 30 times more potent with a 100-year uh, lifespan. So, youngsters, what sort of city are you going to be living in if you just sit around and do your work and you don't become activists? So, basically, we have this the so-called Earth's natural carbon cycle. Um, and we've got various sources and sinks in terms of, you know, we're happy burning away and, and so forth. Um, we know that vegetarian helps us. Uh, vegetation, or very, well, vegetarianism is also good. Um, <laughs> if you actually give up meat, that's a big difference. No, seriously, you save a lot of CO2 if you become a vegetarian and also have less children. Right, because we got too many people in the world. No, I'm serious. These are important things. Um, you know, when you have a look at the um, when you look at the Paris Climate Change Plan Agreement, um, those are on the list. You know, vegetarian and less babies. <laughs> so I'm not saying to you youngsters, you know, you shouldn't have fun, but think. <laughs> um, so. Um, so the, the problem is, is that we were, we were OK up to the Industrial Revolution, and then we got busy making trillions of dollars and giving us all the energy. It's, it's in our veins, right? And we're asking to do a blood transfusion now from fossil over to renewable energy because we have overwhelmed the ability of the Earth's natural carbon cycle to keep the climate stable. And chemists know how to measure the concentration of CO2. And we have satellites and space stations monitoring these. Now, for those of you, who knows how the greenhouse gas effect, who doesn't know how it works? I'm just curious. Just seriously, I'm talking about like really understand the greenhouse gas effects. Only one. So you all understand it. So I don't have to explain it, right? <laughs> um, but there's some absolutely fascinating spectroscopy that goes on up there, you know, under these dilute conditions where you have the rotational spectra of these gases and how they absorb and re-emit and so forth and how the density changes at different levels. And it's an amazingly complex but solvable, quantitatively solvable uh, physics, uh, atmospheric physics. Well, it's a physics problem. But these are the, the major problems. So you get a certain amount of energy. It's uh, re-emitted from the Earth. It's absorbed by um, 
the CO2 and other small molecules that exist in the troposphere. Out here further is the stratosphere. That's another story. The stratosphere is cooling. The troposphere is heating. There's physics behind that. It's quantitative. Um, and you get this re-emission effect. And so it really is behaving like a greenhouse effect. And it's a great problem for physicists maybe to teach their students exactly how this, this problem works. Uh, so, so that's basically that. Now the other thing that we know how to measure quantitatively is temperature. And this is the most recent map of the global temperature departures from the long-term average. And there's no point in saying, well, it's hot there. Uh, you know, and that's really what's going on. You have to take a global average in terms of that. And this year we had uh, another record. Uh, we went up by essentially a degree. Um, uh, this is a, a big deal. And it's not like one organization saying this. So this is a map of the temperature variations, uh, average temperatures around the Earth. Uh, this is obviously the warmest. But NOAA, uh, the WMO, and the NASA Orbiting Carbon Laboratory, I mean, they're all up there monitoring these things, which is great if you want to regulate and put penalties and things like that. And so they can monitor these things at the house level, <laughs> at the industry level, right? at the city level. right? And so if we ever have a situation where you know, things are going to get really bad and we have to really control this, that's why people want to get rid of this monitoring thing, you see. They don't want to know what's really going on up there. So it's getting hotter. And you noticed in Quebec, you know, your jet stream has changed because the temperature has changed. And so the ice, you know, the snow didn't melt in the normal way. And you got, a, you got runoff, but you got a lot more rain and you're not prepared for that. And so, because everything's been fine. I'm not going to answer questions like that right now, OK? Um, but I will afterwards, OK? Uh, a paper just came out on this, and uh, the permafrost is beginning to release gases and so forth. Yeah, that was a fantastic paper that, that just came out. In fact, it's pretty scary. There are a lot of scary papers coming out. Um, but thank you for shaking me up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I think we all want a sustainable world, obviously, you know, and we want everything to be clean and renewable, and we want to protect the environment and, and, and get nice stability so we don't have to worry about these things. But the problem is, is that if you talk to this person, climate change, for example, and all the other deniers in the world and all the lobby groups and all the... I mean, you know, the fossil industries know what's going on because they're investing in renewable energy, right? They know what's going on. So it's, it's very complex global <coughs> politics. But the most important thing is there are no altruistic managers in industry. They'd lose their job. So a company like BASF, the largest chemical company in the world, CO2 is going to be a feedstock. It's a molecule, right? There are many chemists here. You do chemistry with CO2 and you can convert it into, you'll see in a minute what you can convert it into. They're not working on CO2. They're waiting for their business model. They want to see products where they can compete with fossil. And we've got so much fossil fuels in the world, like I hear things like a thousand years, right? And we haven't even touched the Arctic yet, right? So the bottom line is, don't talk to him about climate change. Let's quantify the amount of money that can be made from products made from carbon dioxide. Now, this is not a panacea. I'm not telling you that this is going to be a solution. This is going to be a part of the solution. But what's neat about this is the amount of money that can be made in the global market. OK, now there's a fabulous organization called the Global CO2 Initiative. And they sort of talk about decarbonization, adaption, capture, and storage. And you know, you can have a fight with so many people about each of these, and I'm not going to get into that. But what I'm interested in is this transforming through chemistry and engineering approaches into value-added products. 
um, and so forth. So the guiding principle here, as I've said, is you've got to capture the mark, not only capture the CO2 and do some chemistry with it, is you've got to get a market out there uh, for treating it not as a waste product, but treating it as a, a value-added feedstock. Right. Now, you, did you ever hear that on the national news? Did you ever hear Steve Pakin talk about it on the agenda? Did you ever hear Justin Trudeau or any politician talk about it? Glenn Murray is talking about it, and I'll tell you why he's talking about it. That's why he's talking about it. Because very detailed economic analysis has um, appeared very recently. Most of you wouldn't have seen this. There is a $1 trillion market for products made from CO2 by the year 2030 with a reduction of, of uh, greenhouse gases of 15%. It's an incredible analysis. All the spin-offs involved, all the companies getting involved, all the products, the complete life cycle analysis, and who you would bet on. Where are you going to bet your money for Canada? OK. Um, Europe has got a European CO2 utilization strategy. Um, America, Department of Energy, this has just been published, have got their uh, strategy. Um, I'm not talking about, you know, like improving the efficiencies of businesses, you know what I mean, and industries and all of that. I'm talking about making money out of CO2, right? Giving it back, none of this storage in the ground, you know, and using it to get more oil out, right? <laughs> so that we can make even more CO2 and that, you know, they can make more money and so forth. But the fact is, is that when the CO2 comes out and you start using it, from either concentrated sources, and you know, there's some big ones like power generation, cement plants, biomass, uh, you know, the, uh, the steel industry, agriculture, and so forth. E even breweries put out a lot of very pure CO2 because we worry about the purity. Um, and then there's capturing from thin air, and I'm sure everyone here who's in chemistry knows about entropy. You don't get anything for free. When you go from dilute to concentrated, it's long natural lawns C1 over C2, and uh, that's one of the challenges, which is the cost of carbon dioxide and the purity of carbon dioxide, and where you're sourcing it and the cost of transporting it, right? You know, there is a, it's not just a matter of being in the lab and, and doing some chemistry. Uh, at this stage in the game, we need very practical, we need great innovation and very practical, fast solutions, right? And this is, because we have the grandest challenge facing us that we've ever had. Um, and so there's an amazing amount of work going on on capture and conversion. Uh, there's a huge number of capture products, and all of these are possible things which are so-called sequestration, like we definitely need... I mean, Glenn Murray loves to talk about the boreal forests and how the boreal forests in Canada can basically capture, if we keep them going, 25% of the global CO2, apparently, you know, to keep it stable. So um, there are some very simple uh, things, and people in the Department of Forestry, you know, they know about these things. Um, but there are a tremendous number of chemicals, materials, fuels, minerals, and things that are on the map. Now, there's another thing. By the way, I'm going to talk about some hardcore science. Um, but I thought that you might want to hear this because probably not too many of you think about these things and worry about these things. Um, but I do. Um, so one of the big questions is, sure, you can make products, but we've got to be able to do gigatons per year because we're putting up 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide at the moment, and it's increasing. Okay, and if you think about 40 gigatons, that's bigger than the largest chemical factory. If you add all the chemical, petrochemical, all the things, right, that is more than we produce. Um, and so there's this thing called a learning curve. It's a techno-economic learning curve. And, um, and basically, it's an important thing for people who are funding this whether it's public, whether it's private, industry, 
uh, and so forth. Because if you want to get into this game, if you want to be a serious player in this trillion dollar game, if you want to get a piece of this pie in Canada, this is the bullet we got to buy. OK? So there's all the early stage stuff, which we're great at, right? We're great at it. We're as good as anyone in the world. Um, we invent a lot of stuff. And so these are the sorts of monies that we need in order to sort of be in this field. Proof of concept, proof of system. But then, you see, I work in an energy center in Karlsruhe, you know, and I'm part of that meeting I showed you, Roland Dittmeyer was there. Okay, he's just built a hundred million euro pilot one. I'm building a demonstrator, you know, in the lab. So you go from your experiment to a demonstrator, but to do that, I've got six engineers in the lab now. I'm a chemist with six chemical engineers in the lab. You know why? Because if we want to get to the pilot plants, we're talking serious money. You better be right. And you better be able to compete. And then look what happens when you move into these sorts of investments and you go to partnerships and things like that. Um, and you're worrying about supply chain, all these sorts of things that chemists don't think about. Um, this is sort of where it's getting serious money. And if you really, and, and if you're inventing stuff which is new technology, right, this could come into the market and outperform current technology. So it could actually be cheaper. So this is cost to performance. And this is the time frame over here in terms of years. And now, if you want to build yourself a CO2 refinery, and let's face it, we have a chemical and a petrochemical infrastructure, right? We've got lots of emitters. So somewhere you've got to build a refinery. I'm not talking about storing it under the ground or trapping it, you know, like in Saskatchewan. I'm talking about getting value out of that. We've got to be prepared to spend $5 billion. That's what it's going to cost if we want a piece of this pie. I'm just a lab rat, by the way. I'm a chemist. But I need to know this, right? I need to know this. So this was what inspired me to get involved. Other than doing something crazy, I was inspired by the CO2 refinery. It's just a three atom molecule, guys. Come on. How many chemists are in the room? Let's see the hands. Come on, seriously, let, let's see how many chemists. Okay. It's just CO2, right? What's the problem? So basically, you've got some sort of emitter, some sort of capture technology. By the way, we've got all these technologies now, right? And you know, if there's going to be a cost, there's going to be an efficiency, right? Um, and we've got renewable energy, lots of it, coming on stream faster and faster. We've got heat from the sun. Sun's really hot, OK? Don't forget the heat. 95% or more of industrial processes are thermally driven heterogeneous catalysis. Yeah? And they're driven thermally using fossil energy. So we, we can use heat. We can use light. We can use renewable electricity. We've got loads of that. We give it away sometimes, don't we? So we can use electricity here to do all sorts of things that were on the other slide. Um, and don't forget magnetism, magnetic induction heating. In Germany, they're switching from fossil heated plants to induction heated and electric arc because they've got, what, 80%? No, they're not 80% yet. Their goal is 80% renewable by 2030, I think, something like that. And then, you know, you come in here and you sort of create something exciting. Uh, it's all going to be some sort of catalysis. It's all going to be some sort of materials in there. And then you've got, and, and by the way, there, there are energy flows, there are economic flows, there are materials flows. You know, anyone who's worked in industry knows these types of things. And then you may not get the pure product. So selectivity and activity counts. You've got separation costs in here, purifications. And, and of course, one of the best things you could make in terms of um, replacing um, energy in the transition would be some sort of fuels. Um, this is a useful thing to know. 
I, I work with all these people now. I tell you why I work with all these people. I've never done it in my life before. I know I spun off a couple of companies, but I've never gone this far. Uh, and the reason I went this far is that when Glenn Murray decided to put a bet on my lab, I felt a huge responsibility. And I knew that if I was going to make a real contribution, I needed a lot of help. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not just a matter of making a material and doing a quick catalytic reaction. There was more to it than that. And so I think Canada could be a hub, right? There are lots of countries now that are creating CO2 hubs, right? Toronto's got a lot going there right now. Um, there are quite a few groups. It's really amazing. It wasn't just, you know, when, when there's money for something, you know, everyone's a CO2 expert, but no one's a CO2 expert, if you know what I mean. So, so I think you have to be a little bit careful in terms of, you know, where the funding goes and so forth. But, you know, the fact is, is that, um, you know, e every step um, through from, you know, making some ingredients here, hydrogen, say, electrochemistry of water, we've got one of the probably the best electrolysis com com companies in the world, Hydrogenics, right? These guys supply Germany for their power to gas and power to liquids, right? They take water and make hydrogen. They take hydrogen and CO2. They do Fischer-Tropes chemistry, and they do methanol chemistry. And they're doing it at an industrial scale, right? And you know, the methanol system and the Fischer-Tropes are making hydrocarbons. These are like 100-year-old processes. We know how to solve this problem, right? You're probably thinking, well, what's left for me? Catalysts. Because when you're working at 100 megatons, a half a percent matters, right? And so if you invent new materials and new reactors and new processes, that's where you get the intellectual property, right? If we need a piece of the pie, we better have some intellectual property. But we better be prepared to spend billion dollars, ultimately, right? Maybe it's easier just to do apps. <laughs> Um, so this is a life cycle analysis, and you have to worry about every energy, economic, material flow in order to be profitable and competitive. And so whether or not I ever get to a refinery, that's another question. But if I'm going to take serious money, I want to make sure I've got the right team and that's what the Connell Fund funded, right? They funded a team. So I had to convince about 10 engineering faculty, all engineers. I'm the only chemist. All engineers. Once you've got the materials, you know, and you've done synthesis, structure, property, function, we're terrible at utility, right? Engineers know how to. Engineers, different culture, right? Thermodynamics, kinetics, reactors, processing. Chemists don't learn that stuff, right? We do synthesis structure, property, function, and then we get a bit stuck, right? <laughs> You're laughing, right? <laughs> There's a bit of truth in that, isn't there? Um, so, so there are five commandments, not ten commandments. So if you're going to basically go into CO2 recycling. I mean, we recycle glass, we recycle paper, we recycle all sorts of things. Why aren't we recycling CO2? The trouble is we need to recycle gigatons. <laughs> um, it's only, as I said, it's not a panacea, but it's a, there's a trillion dollars for the taking. That's a lot of people could be employed. Um, so compared to traditional feedstocks in the chemical and various other industries, You've got to reduce overall emissions. You've got to lower materials and energy intensity. You've got to employ safer conditions. You've got to operate on a commercial scale. And you've got to demonstrate economic viability. So there's a thing called the CO2 figure of merit, which is related to energy balance, carbon footprint, fixation. Like, you know, you don't want to be able to fix it for you know, a week. You, know, you may want to fix it in a product for 10 years. And then the market capacity and value. And I gave you that idea. So, um, I know it sounds like, why, why is he thinking about all of these things? I didn't think about these things when I got involved. Okay? I just wanted to do something exciting, and I knew it was a materials problem. If you don't have the materials, you know, 
reactors and processes, we, you know, we're good at that. We're, Canada's good at engineering, right? Um, so I knew that with the experience that my group had in materials, and I knew it was catalysis, and I knew size counts, right? Size, shape, surface, self-assembly, defects, and it either goes into biomedical science or advanced materials, right? And so we had the nano advantage, um, and I need surface area, okay? So I need lots of active sites because the bet that I placed, and I am a betting person because I came from Brighton, right? And when I lived in Brighton, who's read Graham Greene's book, uh, Brighton Rock? Just curious. Anyone read Brighton Rock? No? Oh, it was about the bookmaker crowd, right? The, the bookmakers, who are now the bankers, by the way. So when I was a teenager, we had two types of people in Brighton, right? We had bookmakers with the horses and the dogs, right? And we had retired people. And we had a lot of fun in Brighton because all the girls came over from, to learn languages and, you know, we had lots of fun on the beach <laughs> when I was a teenager. That's an, I could tell you that story. Um, and so in my summer jobs, I was the brain, right? So I did all the accounting for these guys. And I know that the bankers are sophisticated book. They invented hedging, right? They know all about risk uh, and things. Um, but they employed a few physicists and came up with these fantastic risk formulae and, and you know, all these um, financial engineering and, and none of them went to jail. That's why the Americans are so angry, I think. Robert Reich, I know I'm like going all over the place, but I, they were trying to understand what's going on down there. And Robert Reich lectured in Canada, you know, and he worked for Clinton, right? He was the Secretary of Economics, was it, or something? Harvard professor. He said it's very simple. From 1960 up to the banking crisis, their quality of life didn't change very much, right? And then we had the meltdown, and none of those people went to jail. So they thought the deck was stacked against them, and they became very angry. And so you can feed on that anger. So anyway, I had to take a bet. So I decided to bet my group on gas phase heterogeneous catalysis driven by heat, light, or both from the sun. Heat from the sun, infrared radiation, plenty of it. Whenever people do anything with light, they say, oh, if I could only move out the UV, if I could just get into the visible, we want the whole solar spectrum. It's very easy to get the whole solar spectrum. You just make them black. You make black nanostructures. We have the pattern on that. It's called photothermal. So my groups are solar fuels groups. Solar is sexy, but pragmatically, practically, thermal is the way most reactions are driven right now using fossil. And there's plenty of energy from the sun if you can capture it. So I, I took the bet on that. And the reason I bet on it is because 90, 95% of the petrochemical and the chemical industry are heterogeneous. You know, there are hardly any homogeneous processes that are, you know, and we're talking 100 megaton processes. It's no good having a kilogram making some pharmaceuticals. You know, you've got to do big, big volume production uh, here. So I, I thought, well, that just makes more sense. And also, I knew a lot about that field. So you can drive it with light, electricity, magnet, and this is... I'm interested in all of these renewable forms of energy. OK, so here is BASF, right? It's one of the largest manufacturing sectors in the world, one of the largest users of fossil fuels, one of the largest producers of greenhouse gas. And that industry is worth $5 trillion. It's a big industry. And then you've got the electricity generating industry. That's worth about $5 trillion, I think. And again, that's also driven by fossil. And there's a huge amount of greenhouse gas associated with that. And you can drive, um, uh, basically, you can take all the excess electricity and store it electrochemically into water and make hydrogen. And we need hydrogen and we need CO2, right? And we've got hydrogenics uh, in Quebec. We've got uh, CO2 solutions, great little company. We got Morgan Solar, right, which is one of the best uh, solar collector concentrator people. We've got a number of huge engineering companies like Hatch, for example. 
Uh, we've actually got the building blocks. Um, and we've got Sarnia, they build refineries, right? Someone built those refineries. Um, so basically, a CO2 refinery, once the reactor and process engineering and all that you know, life cycle stuff is done, it can seamlessly integrate, in principle, into that infrastructure. Now, by the way, just because I'm saying this doesn't mean I'm right. You can question me. You, know, you can give me hell on this. Um, and that's what I get every day. <laughs> so I'm used to dealing with hell. Um, but the fact is, you name it, you can make it this way, including ammonia. You know, once you've got hydrogen, the Harbour Bosch process, let me tell you about Harbour Bosch and, and fertilizer. We've got a big fertilizer industry in this country. 150 megatons of um, urea, right? Two gigatons of CO2. It's a hundred year old process. Fisher Tropes making hydrocarbons, hundred year old process. Right? Huge CO2 footprints. So, you know, when we didn't worry about CO2, it was fine, you know, and so forth. But now we have to think of clean, green ways of dealing with these processes. And so once you've got CO2 and you've got water and you've got renewable energy, you can get into syngas, methanol, you can get into olefins, you can go through into natural gas. And this is very useful, actually, even though we got lots of natural gas. You know, you can, if you can take the CO2 and put it into pipelines, you know, um, and so forth. So instead of putting hydrogen through pipelines where you're stuck at about 10, 15%, you can convert it into methane. And this way it's much safer in terms of corrosion and, and safety and, and so forth. So that was my way of thinking, right? So if it, if it was easy, it would all be done, right? It'd be finished, there'd be nothing left for you. But I promise you, in your lifetime, it will not go away. CO2 will not go away in your lifetime in terms of opportunities for doing research with it. You can build a career around CO2. So what's heterogeneous catalysis? So basically, you come from the gas phase. It's a gas-solid interaction. Most of them, it could be liquid, but it's, it's gas. So you've got to understand surface adsorption, surface sites, uh, be, and so forth. This can come in and react either from the gas phase or co-adsorb. So some of you may remember Langmuir Hinshelwood and Eli Ridial mechanisms for heterogeneous catalysis. And then there's some magical chemistry that occurs. And then you desorb. And all of these have got activation barriers. There's a free energy profile for this. It's very temperature dependent. It depends whether it's in the ground state or the excited state. And to really know what's going on, you've got to get the details of the surface chemistry to understand the catalysis. OK, and there are a lot of excited youngsters out there publishing papers like crazy, but we just, you know, you very rarely know what's going on. You don't know um, basically a turnover frequency. You don't know an efficiency. You know what I mean? Because these are hard measurements to make quantitatively. So one of the things that we realized, other than doing all the catalytic work that I'll show you, and I've got to tell you, my six chemical engineers really make a difference when it comes to, you know, they don't do anything by chance. They compute. The th these are all equilibrium reactions. They're either endothermic or exothermic. You know, you either make more molecules of the same number or less. They're all pressure and temperature and composition dependent. OK? And so it's not just a matter of, you know, you've got to go in and compute these things and all the software's available for doing this. But one of the things I wanted to know is I wanted to build into spectrometers of different types and conductivity measurements and so forth all the gas handlings and all the re reactions as a function of temperature pressure. These are flow reactions in industry. For large scale production, it's going to be flow. It's not going to be batch. Right. And so there's nothing like good old fingerprinting infrared. Chemists know how to fingerprint. And it's not an easy experiment, but this is real time watching chemistry occurring. And I've got a million spectra, but I'm not going to show you too many spectra. I want to just give you a feeling for this field right? of how we go about it. So it took me a long time to figure out, how do you go in the lab and do this type of chemistry? You know, how do you think, how do you actually think about 
you know, you've got a periodic table. There it is. You've got an infinity of combinations of, of different things. So I decided to bet the farm on metal oxides. And the reason is, when you go to a refinery and you see that huge tower, there's 10 tons of catalyst in there, and it's got to last 10 years. <laughs> so you want something that's going to survive this type of chemistry. And so the majority of them, believe it or not, exist in the ground. They're called minerals, metal oxides. <laughs> I just gave a lecture to the Mineralogical Society of Canada. It was called, Can Minerals, Save, Can Minerals Solve the Climate Change Problem? <laughs> and the answer is, they couldn't believe it. They thought, well, we were just in you know, minerals to make gemstones and things like that. It was a gem geminological society. Um, so I decided to go after metal oxides um, because metal oxides are not just metal oxides. And the ones that are most interesting are the non-stoichiometric ones. So this is where it's going to get a bit scientific from now on. Okay, We've had the, the sort of background of the field. So um, it turns out we're interested in surfaces. So these are generic metal oxide surfaces. And so I'm not going to go through all of these, but oxygen vacancies are very interesting. Um, metal vacancies are interesting. Um, bridge bonding OH groups, whether they're acidic or basic. Whenever you see an unsaturated site, it's a Lewis acid. This is a Lewis base. This could be a Bronsted acid or a Bronsted base. And you could have two together here and, and so forth. So there's a whole field and books and courses on non stoichiometric There's an infinity of these. And once you go into what we call defect engineering, right, you have, you've got to know solid state materials chemistry. And this is at the nanoscale. Right? So I've just published, uh, with some of my students, a tutorial on this in ChemSoc Rev, which is a fantastic journal, which is a blueprint. So I'm going to just summarize what I think is it's good for students. How do I go in the lab and do this, right? You know what I mean, John? You know, if you were joining my group right now, you'd say, well, where do I start? You know? <laughs> and I don't want to copy what everyone else has done. So I got very excited. Oh, and by the way, you'll see in a minute that um, something very important comes up. So I happen to like defect engineered systems where I have a Lewis base sitting near vacancies and an unsaturated metal, which is a Lewis acid. And when you've got vacancies there, <coughs> these vacancies have amazing effects on these oxides. You name the property, you can get it. It can be metallic, semiconducting, insulating, and so forth. And when you have a vacancy, this is even more Lewis acidic. And when you look at the field of heterogeneous catalysis, it's all acidity, basicity, redox activity, uh, bronzed acidity, bronzed basicity, this is the language of heterogeneous catalysis. And it's an old field, 100 years old or more. <clears throat> so you've got to understand how hydrogen interacts with these systems. So, you know, when hydrogen comes in, it can split heterolytically. Okay, so I've got a hy hydride. Hello, a hydride's a reducing agent, right? Very powerful, right? And I've got a proton, that's, a, that's an acid. Right? If it can split homolytically, but so if these are both protons, where did the two electrons go? Well, they're going to go into either a localized or delocalized um, band structure situation. Um, and if I've got an OH sitting next to a base sitting next to an acid, Doug Steffen got very excited when we showed that you can make a proton on a hydride, which is a frustrated Lewis pair a surface frustrated Lewis pair, and he's the pioneer of that. We have the pioneer in Canada of a whole new world of catalysis, Doug Steffen, and he does it homogeneously. So this was the first heterogeneous example of, of that. That will come up in a minute. Then you've got to understand how, now, this is all the different modes of interaction of CO2 with all those different stoichiometric and non-stoichiometric oxides. They can all be picked out by fingerprint in the infrared, we use uh, C13 labeling always uh, in order to get isotope patterns so you can define in detail the nature of the surface species from the isotopic structure and so forth. So you can see your challenges already, right? Which is you only want one product. I don't want 20 products. <coughs> so you really want to control uh, not only the rate, but also the selectivity. 
And then the key thing is, is that once you sort of understand hydrogen, you understand CO2, um, then you would like to know how they react with, um, in other words, the, the hydrides and protons and uh, these bronsted acid sites and so forth, how they react with CO2. And again, there are all these different modes. It might go through bicarbonates and end up giving you maybe uh, um, carbon monoxide and water. It might go through formate, <coughs> which could go to acetal and methoxide and methanol and things like that. It might go to, through carbonyls that get reduced through to methane and so forth. So it's not like, you know, this isn't known. This is heterogeneous catalysis. But industry in the past has always thought CO2 is a waste product. Now they're looking at it as something with value. And because of the pressure of climate change, what's going on in industry has changed. Now, now I know you probably hate me with timing, and you can tell me <clears throat> how long I've got. Um, but let me take you through the way we're thinking in even more detail. So our first paper hit the front cover because of all my art science stuff. We, we, are, we call them front cover lovers. Right? And, um, you know, it's nice to be able to represent your work and, and get them in this way. So this one is a black hole, you can see, and these are literally black materials. Uh, these are not top down. These are made by simple dipping of silicon into an etch, and out comes these nanowires with the length and the separations and the diameter is controllable. These black nanowires, in which you can build catalysts into those, because remember, these could be throwaway silicon tiles that weren't any good for solar cells, but they're very good as catalyst substrates. And when you shine light on these, uh, basically they absorb all the way through to 2,000 nanometers. They're, and the phonons in there, anything above the band gap, relaxes in the form of phonon heat, for example. And you can measure local temperatures using Stokes anti Stokes Raman. You get a Boltzmann temperature using one sun with an ultra black that absorbs 95% of every photon that falls on it, you can get local temperatures in there of 500 degrees. Most industrial things work at 300 degrees, 200 degrees, all right? And so you can sort of stick it in, it deactivates, and you throw it away and put another one in. Just like solar electricity, you have a solar fuels farm. Um, so that, that was one of our big breakthroughs. We have intellectual property on that, and these are going into demonstrator models. Uh, so these were published, two papers went into advanced science, and this was the defected system. Okay. I hate to even ask the time. Yeah? Are you going to be strict with me? Maybe. <laughs> ah, okay. So we've got a, another... No, no, I can't do it. Um, so I won't be able to talk about the science then, so I'll have to finish off, okay? How many of you have to leave? <laughs> Feel free to leave, okay? Okay. Um, so let me quickly, I will go through quickly. This happens to be, and don't sort of say, oh, it's not Earth abundance and all of that. This was our first system which was unequivocally driven just by light. So these were, this was a solar fuel system. And uh, that was the objective. It took me a while. Uh, these are the missing oxygens in there. These blue things are the, the sites. And simply by controlling the dehydroxylation, you can control the defects. You can control X, Y, and Z. I'm making it look easy, but that's basically how it worked. And so that, this is a surface. Every surface is different. Uh, these materials are nanostructures. This is two nanometers. And this particular system can make either carbon monoxide or methanol, right? And this one's endothermic, this one's exothermic. So it turns out that as, as you change temperatures, and this one's making, um, this is the same number of molecules, this one's making less molecules. So in, you know, pressure, you know, in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, um, you have to think, where are you in the equilibrium diagram to make either CO and methanol, and that's all computed through the thermodynamics and the kinetic calculations. Um, so these were the materials. We had the nano advantage. And basically, um, 
You name the technique, we applied it. And uh, these have been published in some decent journals, like Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, and this one here involved um, actually the first paper that actually involved uh, transient absorption spectroscopy measurements, which sort of probes uh, the excitation of electrons and holes across the band gap and how the electrons relax into these sites here, right, which are oxide sites, um, in here oxide vacancies and unsaturated indiums, and these are those OH groups. So we showed that the whole, all these states could be observed, all the lifetimes could be observed, and these trap holes and these trap electrons, and that's crucial because these like to recombine in femtoseconds and picoseconds, which is much faster than chemistry. Chemistry is very slow. So you've got to trap the carriers in the defects in order for them to then transfer to the CO2 and the hydrogen to do chemistry. You see what I'm trying to say? Chemistry is slow, physics is fast, okay? And that's been one of the problems. And so that was uh, sort of part of it. Um, again, we work with a large-scale computational materials chemistry group. Um, and not only do they do ground state calculations, they also do excited state. Very few groups can do excited state calculations. If you shine light on stuff and make electrons and holes, you've got to do excited state. Okay, and what we also found, which was remarkable, is that you know, when the hydrogen comes in and it undergoes heterolytic splitting and then this uh, CO2 comes in and it starts grabbing hydrides and protons and it makes products, um, Probably those of you do DFT, these are the computation methods, those are zero degrees Kelvin calculations. But we're functioning at higher temperatures. And so when you actually start building temperature in with these very fancy um, ab initio molecular dynamics, metadynamics, and we have a fabulous group that is part of the team, what you find is something truly, every, every step has a barrier. Right? And you can sort of figure out which are rate determining steps. We measure kinetics as a function of partial pressure. We do temperature dependence to get activation barriers. And what blew my mind on this is that when you think of temperature, you think of Arrhenius, you know, activation energies. But when you think of temperature with a two active sites, right, the hydro, the lattice expands. So the distance between the two active sites has changed too. So that's tuning the acidity and the basicity, and that's why at different temperatures you get different barriers, and that is a full free energy profile. So this sort of shows you that you need theory as well as experiment to help. So basically what I'm saying here is what we've discovered that when you have these surface frustrated Lewis pairs, <coughs> I might be able to finish in five minutes or so, something like that. Okay, you want me to have a heart attack? I'm an old guy, right? <laughs> you know, it'd be terrible. He, yeah, we invited him, but you know, we had to take him to the hospital. <laughs> so, um, notice I put a different metal there. I want you to notice that. So now this is what a chemist does, right? You know, in orga who's an organic chemist here? Yeah, you know what you do, right? You play with functional groups, right? You know, change, you know, all the various things. So what we do is we, we functionalize our materials. And again, we don't do it by chance. We do it by design. And so if you think of, um, of Lewis basicity and Lewis acidity, you can sort of see that if I change oxidation states, if I change the size of the, of the metal, and so forth, if I change the electronegativity, I am going to tune all of the barriers in that system, right? And so these are sophisticated forms of materials chemistry, especially at the nanoscale. And so basically, the hydrogen splits, the CO2 reacts, and we see in the spectroscopy this formate group. Right? So the hydride went to the electrophilic carbon, right? then it splits again, you get more protons, and it goes to the acetal, it does it again, you need three hydrogen molecules right, to make methanol, and you now get methoxide, and then the proton picks that off, you get methanol and you lose water and you're back in the cycle. And so what you've got to figure out here is that if you're coming around this cycle, 
Why did it do the reverse water gas shift and kick out CO and water rather than continuing round here to make methanol, right? This is selectivity. And so you've got to think is what are the properties in here that I have to tune to sort of make this thing undergo a reconstruction to kick out CO and water. So again, we've done a huge amount on that. We've published papers. This particular system beats the industrial methanol catalyst. And basically what it's telling me, the, these are actually cubic structures called the bixibite structures. They're actually naturally occurring minerals. Um, and you can make them in iron, cobalt, nickel, you know. We just happened to start with indium because it was the first one that worked. But what that system did, it allowed me to write the rules of the game. We're learning the rules of the game so that I can actually supervise a student rather than saying, I don't know how to do it, right? Sort of just go in the lab and, you know, at least we can go in the lab and do some things sensibly. <clears throat> so one of my favorite discoveries, and this was in PNAS, is that we measured the activation energy uh, for this uh, reverse water gas shift in the dark and in the light, namely ground state versus excited state. And what we discovered is that in the dark, this is sort of protonic and this is sort of hydridic. But when you go to the excited state in the light, the hole gets trapped there, makes it more protonic, and the electron gets trapped there, makes it more hydridic. So what you're tuning is excited state acidity and basicity. You think, oh, that's a great discovery, right? And then you look in the organic chemistry literature, and it's all there in organic chemistry, right? If you make a carboxylic acid or, you know, some amine thing, electrons and holes got to get trapped somewhere. And so basically what I think we've discovered, I believe for the first time, is that you can tune. In other words, it's quantifying it better. You know what I mean? It's allowing me to tune the most important thing, which is acidity and basicity in the ground. And what we gained in the kinetics was 20 kilojoules per mole. And so, you know, we're getting some decent rates, it turns out. So I'm not going to be able to finish this, but I'll tell you the way of thinking. So we're now basically trying to say, OK, that system works, and it's not going to change the world. But if I could get it up by a factor of 10,000 in the conversion rates and the turnover frequencies, you know, maybe we could move towards the demonstrators, and if we can control that. So what we do is we build those catalysts into these ultra-black materials. So this is photothermal, or we can take a black nanoparticle and build it on that, right? So you've got little nano heaters in there. And it's incredible. I'll tell you something about these nano heaters in a minute. When you heat things at the nanoscale, the thing doesn't sinter like when you heat things at the macroscopic scale because you've got this little nanoscopic heater, right, that's, that's getting hot by either a plasmonic effect or a phonon effect or an electron relaxation effect. It doesn't matter as long as you know, you can do non-radiative relaxation. <clears throat> and the heat transfer and the heat diffusion is local. It's not macroscopic. So instead of these catalysts deactivating with time, they're stable. And um, I'm hoping that comes out in nature energy. So we made um, all sorts of nanorods out of these nanocrystals. And the electrons and holes hop from particle to particle, and so they the, the lifetime gets longer as a function of length, and uh, the rates go up. <clears throat> this was the isomorphous, so you basically change the size, the oxidation state, and uh, you change the um, um, electronegativity. This one, you take these materials and put a little nanometal on there, and hydrogen splits homolytically. It's called hydrogen spillover. And that then forms protons and hydrides with a much lower activation energy. And this one I'm most proud of, and I'm not going to have time to talk about, which is that if you put a nanooxide on a nanooxide, then the lattice mismatch between the two causes lattice strain, and it builds in more defects, and you basically make more electrons and holes, and they live longer, and, and so forth. And that one's being submitted to nature right now. So um, that's basically it. I won't show you the science. There's loads of nice science. Oh, by the way, in that one there, when we put the nanoheaters on there, the rate went up by 1,000. 
through the hydrogen spillover effect. So basically, I'm saying if you've got the nanometal, you split the hydrogen homolytically, and then it forms the proton and the hydride somehow, and we went from micromoles to millimoles. And I've got to tell you, rates of millimoles per hour per gram, you can do the back of the envelope, translate into gigatons per ton of catalyst per year. So you're talking about, you know, but I need 10 tons of that, right? So, you know, this is scaling is important. So going on, uh, this is the strain one. So the idea, if you've got a lattice mismatch, you create defects like vacancies, and we have synthetic work. And you can see the lattice strain because you see uh, basically shifts in the X-ray diffraction. And I'm going to blow your mind with this picture. So here's the pure indium. Here's an oxide I put it on. Here are three different. Um, so we nucleate and grow one oxide on the other, by the way. We're not mixing them physically. So we actually nucleate and grow this on that. And that, you can see the mismatch. You can measure the strain. But this is unbelievable, right? These are atomic resolutions of the pristine and the strained. And you can physically see the change in the dimensions. You can physically, and you can map the actual um, atomic maps on here, so niobium, indium, oxygen maps, you can sort of see. And what they are, this is the thing that really surprised me. There's a little nano catalyst sitting on the, on the um, other oxide, the support. And that's only about five nanometers. And the strain caused the entire particle's dimension. It wasn't a gradient. The incomplete particle at the nanoscale changed its dimensions. And the strain was quite significant. Look at this, 4.3%. So you can quantify this from x-ray diffraction. You can quantify the amount of one material on the other by ICP and so forth. You can look in the XPS, and you can sort of see for the strain system which way the charge is transferring. Right? So the catalyst, the indium, is moving up in energy. So uh, that means charge is transferring from the indium to the niobium oxide. And uh, basically, you can look at the rates of these things and so forth. Um, you can measure the lifetimes, and you see they get longer. So the defects are trapping the electrons and holes. So these are time-resolved photoluminescence. And basically, the end of the story, and there's no time for it, is we compare the unstrained and the strained in terms of acidity and basicity. We compare it in the dark and the light. And uh, that was it. So there's that picture of the little nanometal heater, right? Another front cover lover. Uh, a little nano heater, when the heat diffu This is a real physics problem. If there are any physicists here, here's a challenge for you. How does heat diffuse from at the nanoscopic scale from the heater, which absorbs and gets hot, which we can measure temperatures of these, uh, to uh, this metal oxide, where chemistry is occurring on both of them. But basically, what we discovered is um, uh, there it is. This system doesn't destabilize. right? And these are different days. We run for a day, and we stop, run for a day, and stop. And that's important, right? If you're driving things with sunlight, and you've got all this stuff, you want to make sure you can stop and start. I don't know if you know in Germany, where they've got a massive amount of solar, uh, that when they had an eclipse, Germany didn't shut down. They had an eclipse of the sun. That's how good their grid is. Okay. So where are we? This is called technology. If you students ever get involved in this, and you think you're going to do something important, they're going to ask you, which technology, re re technology readiness level are you? What, which TRL, right? So you start off and you ask this chap here. Oh, no, you wouldn't be the one you asked for the basic research money. So you get your $10 of funding, right? <laughs> We're only competing against the rest of the world. that have got billions, $350 billion in China, right? <laughs> um, you then move up to, uh, well, you saw the cost of it. And I think that um, I, I was already doing applied research when I started this. And we are now at, and this is a demonstrator. And this one here, which is totally calculated by engineers, we got all the different gases, the pressures, the temperatures, the reactor, compressors, condensers, recirculators, you name it. Chemists don't know how to do that. 
right? And what you get is drip, 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 which is methanol comes out. And that's what you need to see. And I'm having a hard time getting funding. <laughs> Um, so here it is. This is what engineers love. And you know the good news is, once you've got methanol, I can build in an acid catalyst there and dehydrate it. And now I was at a meeting with, um, I'm basically finished now, I'm just having fun. Uh, but this is important. Diesel is dirty, right? And all the automobile industry is under gigantic pressure to get rid of diesel and replace it with a clean burning fuel that doesn't have carbon-carbon bonds. And this is like handling propane. So you dehydrate, it's a well-known process, and already DME is going into Volvo trucks. Okay, there'll be Mack trucks, there'll be GM, and I was at a meeting where we, it was all about DME. So that's why renewable energy, CO2, water splitting, methanol, dimethyl ether, great project. It's not going to change the climate at this stage, but we're getting rid of carcinogenic. You know, your buildings, you build them white and they go black. <laughs> and you're breathing that stuff. So you put it all together. Look, Quebec, right? So you emit, you um, collect. Next Hydrogen does great. They came out of Ballard, right? Next, um, you take the nano advantage. You work with Morgan Solar, they know how to collect light, so we have to build photoreactors because solar fuels are interesting, especially using the heat and light. Do you know something in Germany? I was sitting with a friend on a farm and I looked at his house and he had solar cells, right? But he had some black pipes. I said, what's that? He said, that's how we heat the water. So I go, oh. And in Toronto, there's a, a swimming pool company that basically has black pipes on the roof of the house and it keeps the swimming pool warm the whole summer. Heat and light from the sun. Don't waste it. So Canada, please take this message to NSERC. Canada has got to start building demonstrators and pilot plants. We can do the basic science, but we actually know quite a lot now. Engineers can start doing this. Um, and we've got to do that to be in the game because we're behind the rest of the world. But we can catch up. We'll not catch up, but we can get a piece of the trillion dollar pie. Right? We're clever in Canada. <clears throat> and so you get into a cyclic system. So that's the story. And so you saw me in my crazy senior citizen mode. So here's me in Brighton. What are you going to do when you grow up? <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, Dr. Ozen, for this enlightening and provocative lecture. Um, for me, as an age studies scholar, the story of beginning to end and going back um, is also extremely important. And also asking questions about what it is that we do um, with uh, the knowledge we have, um, not only to uh, you know, create better science, to create better uh, papers that we write as humanity scholars, but to think about these broader questions and tie them to questions of economics and politics, I think, is important. So we have a few minutes, I think, for questions before we move to the reception. And I know there must be some burning questions or things that you want to ask. Uh, I'm sorry if I rushed, made you rush the science a bit. Well, I didn't have a heart attack. OK, that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So are there any questions before we continue the conversation at the reception? I'm so happy that you gave me an insight in what you do. My grandson is a chemi chemical engineering student at Queens. Whoa. And he, I've been criticizing him all along. What are you going to do with chemistry, okay? It's already been done. Now, he's, he's a scholar there. He's paying his way through. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I, unfortunately, am a mining engineer. Yeah. You're what, ty I, what type of engineer mining. are you? Mining. And okay. All I talked about was cyanide and arsenic. Now they are in little bits, you know. They don't hurt you. 
Uh, anyways, the, in the process, you, you have to use all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I used to speaking of CO two. Now it's not off topic, but I worked underground in a mines, a mile down, all my working half of my working life. It's very pleasant working down there. I'm very comfortable. But as soon as I get in the surface, I it's a disaster. What do you so mean? We, well, what? hey, everything's going wrong underground. Is oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> You know, when you're a mile down. Is, uh, is the message uh, that we should all live underground then? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyways, I'm getting to the point. Of right. Okay. No CO2. Now, I, I worked in metals, and the one that intrigued me the most was it was uh, working in uranium mine. Oh, okay. It, did, it didn't kill me. Okay. okay. Uh, I worked in nuclear power plants. Okay. And I just want to say, nobody's ever died in a nuclear power plant. And no CO2 is given off. I'm not promoting No, no that's nuclear. absolutely true. Absolutely true. Why? What's wrong with it? It's 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 the politics, geopolitics that'll, and it's only been around for 70 years since the Manhattan Project, right? Yeah. So well, why did why did Germany drop nuclear? I mean, they had Fukushima. No, and they decided way, yes. it was the right time to get rid of nuclear. France next door has got 85 percent nuclear, right? J J uh, Japan went off nuclear, but they're back on it now. You know why? Are they it, back it, on it? Oh yes, they are, and and it's cheaper too. Well, yeah. I mean, nuclear is wonderful. Yeah. It's <laughs> so do you have a qu maybe what's a the question? question? The question is, what? Uh, uh, I was just kind of giving you a, a, mm. a viewpoint of. You know how a mining yeah. engineer thinks. Yes. The question is, why is Alaska hot? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, that I asked that question when you, were you asked it the first time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, well, there are there are lots of reasons. I mean, um, I presume you're not a denier, are you? No, no, no. I, oh, okay. That's fine. I was just checking. No. Okay. <laughs> not at all. Um, I'm 80 years the old. So I, I can't the, deny anymore. I'm almost as old as you. Look, the ice caps are melting. That's for sure. If you look at the Arctic, so it doesn't reflect as much light, right? Um, the sea absorbs more light, right? Um, you've, you know what permafrost is? Yes, I. Right. These I, I, are. I walked on muskeg. Yeah. But basically, for the students in chemistry, they're hydrogen bonded clathrates. Okay. They're porous hydrogen bonding, and they've trapped they trapped a trillion tons of methane. Trillion. Okay, and if that pops, and some people think it could be a first order phase transition, right, which is if you reach a tipping point, um, that's goodbye life on Earth, basically. Right, so methane is also, we work on methane and CO2. You can take methane and CO2 and do dry reforming, and make synthesis gas, right, which can then make fissiotropes and methanol. So. We do know how to deal with this. Um, it's, it's a case of, <laughs> well, you know what it is. I don't want to get into the politics of it um, and so forth. Um, something like 90, 95% of government subsidies in most places go into fossil, searching for more fossil. Something like, you know, if we were putting 95% into renewable, we would move like crazy. Okay, so there's a lot of things you tend not to think about and so forth. Um, uh, there's trillions of dollars at stake. If you were making billions of dollars, are you going to give it up? You know, as I said, that's why I said we've killed uh, 230 billion, a million people. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't care about life. Well, the government can so print a lot of money, can it? It's so doing it for the last three years. Anyway, we can... Uh, I you're, a, you're an old timer. I can start, like by, answering <laughs> the, I can start <laughs> by answering the question. Um, who else? Anyone else? Over here. Damon? So, I mean, the Arctic is warming about four times faster than the planet as a whole, so I mean, that's why Alaska is warmer. Um, but but that's related to some of the things that yeah, I said, right? Yeah, sea ice, albedo feedback, all yeah. these things. Yes. Um, so thank you for the presentation. It was I found it quite interesting. I I appreciate your enthusiasm for for this technology. I I don't entirely buy your sales pitch for it as a climate solution. It's and not. I, and, uh, well, I never said it was a climate solution. Okay, so my question is, how I said could it you was a, I said it was a trillion dollar industry. <laughs> right. Right? That could so reduce 15% so 15% by 2030. Top people in the world have done that estimate. So how do you prevent the CO2 from ending up in the atmosphere 
in the end? Or is that even an objective? Well, you, I mean, there are different capture technologies. In the end, you'd like to do it from thin air. But, you know, the percentage of that is, what, 0.04% and so forth. Um, but um, I just listened to Roland Dittmeyer, who was basically making methanol from thin air. You could actually buy a system now. The beauty of this is that you can buy a modular system that basically takes the CO2 and water out of thin air. This is a Kaiser Institute. It's all on the internet, you know, the, on the KIT system. You can buy a module that will electrolyze the water from the air, CO2 from the air, um, and right, take so it so through. Direct fish. air capture, convert yes. it to fuel, burn it, yes. and put it back. I mean, Climeworks okay. is probably the best in the game at doing that. That's a Swiss company. Sunfire is a Dresden company. They got together. It's a Helmholtz Institute. Um, by the way, we have a contract with him, so we're, we got the best people. Okay, so right. I guess uh, wait, I, I'm not there yet. No, no, no. Uh, the beauty of this, um, let's not talk climate change, right? Can you imagine no, supplying a unit change, like no? that into a remote community in Canada where they can make um, fuel on the spot, okay? Can you imagine, instead of building a 10-ton reactor, you order a thousand modules and you put them together like Lego building blocks, you know, and so forth. So um, you don't have to buy that because, you know, that person who I showed you, he doesn't want to know about climate change, right? But if, and, and by the way, they're working like crazy on this in America. It doesn't matter what you're hearing on the news, that's all politics. Right? I mean, that thing I showed you from DOE, that is a very serious report from very serious scientists and engineers. It's going on. They're not going to stop that. There's no way it's going to be stopped. Right? That thing is all to do with profit. But I like the idea of modular systems. Like I say, and the question is, why am I in the game? I mean, what's my role? My role is to improve the catalytic side of things mainly maybe design some reactors, okay, you know, because if we're going to use heat and light from the sun, that's different to heating things up with fossil fuel, right? So my engineers are worrying about modeling things and building things like that and so forth. Um, but, okay, but if we're in yeah. concerned about CO2 going up in the atmosphere, which is how you started your talk. Well, how there is 40 how gigatons how going up. How does this prevent that from happening? Well, there's a transition going on. You're not going to stop the transition in renewables. I mean, in Ontario, you're not going to stop the, imp you know, with all the cap and trade, carbon trading, right? W most of that money, that's not going into innovation, unfortunately, but pragmatically, it's going into improving the efficiencies of industries and buildings and homes and cars and transitioning. And so, you know, it's a hundred year job. Okay, you're having a blood transfusion, right? You're going from fossil blood to renewable blood and so forth. It's up to you kids to make this happen, okay? But you've got to get all these things in your head so that you don't sound silly. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, I'm not an expert in any of these areas, um, but at least I know who to talk to, right? And I know who to work with and things... Right? It's got to be a whole systems approach. Do you know what I mean by that? Are you an engineer? No, I'm a climate scientist. You're a what? A climate scientist. Are you a believer or a denier? <laughs> <laughs> a believer, yes. Yeah? Um, you know it's a, it's a grand challenge. I'm glad you came. I haven't actually met a climate scientist before, so we could uh, talk about this. Um, but the people who are developing these strategies, namely, you know, scientists, engineers, policymakers, industry, you know, government, and, and so forth, this problem is a whole system approach. You've got to bring all these people together. It's beyond the Manhattan Project. We're not building a bomb, right? You know, we're not solving cancer. We're trying to save this planet from a disaster, right? And we don't know when it's going to occur, but we have a good feeling that 2030 is, is an important point, and 2050 is an important point. Malcolm? Yeah, so this is a good discussion. You can go on. I'm happy to go all night. <laughs> <laughs> you're not saying that you have to take the methanol to Sorry, who's talking? Oh, sorry, I didn't know. It was like a voice was coming from nowhere. So you're not saying that you have to take the methanol that you create this way 
and reburn it. You could turn it into well, if you're if you've got a cyclable like system, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, there are certain systems where we'll probably the energy density of fuels is huge. Can I, have you ever seen the picture of an electric truck versus a, a, a DME truck, for example? Okay, a, or a diesel, right? The truck will run on a little tank like that, and the whole truck is a battery, basically. And so there are certain situations like gigantic ships. I mean, planes are becoming electric, okay? Um, there are companies, I know that's crazy, I've been studying this. But, um, you know, uh, Boeing, um, Airbus, um, some smaller companies, they're doing short haul things now. They're trying to develop short haul flights running on batteries and so forth. So, but there will be certain situations where you, you need the energy density of a hydrocarbon fuel and so forth. But, but you know, I've written 65 opinion editorials, um, which you can read, OK? Um, and I wrote them mainly because I wanted to learn, OK? Um, and I wrote one called Electrified World, right? There are a couple of engineers in Stanford, a civil engineer and an environmental engineer. I don't know if the climate scientists ever read this paper. <laughs> but they basically showed that if you go from the fossil world into a fully electrified world, more or less, you end up with more jobs, less mortality. Um, there was a whole collection of things. Um, the, the economics of it were even improved and so forth. And so I sort of thought to myself, my God, uh, if we're moving to a fully electrified world, why am I bothering? And I think what we're doing is we're going through a 100-year transition Right? This technology that I'm showing you, this science and technology, it's absolutely minute in the scheme of things. Right? It's just beginning to take off. Okay? It's just, we're just beginning to understand the economics of it, the energetics of it, and the contribution that it can make. I never said that this was a solution for climate change. Well, maybe I did. I didn't mean to say that. It's, <laughs> it's not a panacea. It's definitely not a panacea, but it, it's, it's one of the things, if you look through these various uh, strategies for uh, solving this problem, it's one of the strategies. At the moment, you can do a huge amount. Of this, you're going to get me going. I better stop. <laughs> um, one more question, and then we will. I don't mind the questions, but you know, I just don't want to. People will still ask you questions when we go out in the hall, I believe. Have any of you listened to Lewis Black? when he does his rants. Oh, this is a question here. Um, yes. Here is a question. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this material, but I worry about the stability of this uh, cutting. I just showed you it gets better with time. Um, <laughs> because it's got to last think, 10 years. I think uh, when the material reacts with hydrogen and di uh, uh, the carbon uh, oxide, uh, the morphology will change. Also, I think the size probably also increase. If I was thinking like you, I wouldn't do an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking about this uh, reliable of the catalyst. As reliability. Well, I mean, <laughs> are you in this game? Yeah, I'm also studying not materials, but not in this uh, material. Another yeah. type of material. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you think of all the different ways that a, a catalyst can deactivate, right? Right. If if we get to technology redness, you know, a stage where I'm going to start asking for demonstrate, you know, be, beyond the dem not the pilot, but beyond the demonstrator, maybe a um, like Roland Dittmeyer from KIT is making sort of gallons per day, sort of stuff, uh, and and so forth. Um, the question's going to be stability, right? You should have asked a, a question before that, which is, what about the purity of the CO2? How pure does it have to be? Catalyst poison, right? They don't just deactivate through sintering, agglomeration, changes in morphology, and God knows what. You know, how tolerant are they? How often are you going to have to change the catalyst? And things like that, right? This is why you guys are going to have research throughout your career. <laughs> if it was easy, it would have been done. Right? Is that a good enough answer to you? <laughs> I've been in the nano game 47 years. There's a lot of experience there, right? And there's a lot of rubbish in the literature. 
Do you know what my most downloaded paper was? Nano reproducibility. <laughs> Think about it as a nano person. Hey, right? Can you repeat the same prep twice? <laughs> yes, a question here? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Imagine you were living in the best of all worlds, best of all Canadas, and you get all the money you would like um, being taken maybe from mm. some fossil industry or so. Um, how quickly <laughs> would this system be up and running? Is it something that you would, your gut feeling would say, what well, time frame ideally could be achievable? Well, pilot plants are being built in Japan, in uh, Germany, um, I think the Netherlands, Sweden, and so forth. Um, but you know, there's, there's plenty of CO2 for everyone. There's 40 gigatons. Um, and so I, I would say, you see, that DOE report I mentioned uh, on a whole systems approach, it's, it's on the web, you can read it. And if you, if you can't find it, ask me. Um, that was a fantastic report. It says, if I'm going to bet my money on some technologies, I'm only going to bet on the ones that can do a gigaton a year. A giga is a billion. The large, what's the largest plant you know in terms of production? You showed the BASF. Yeah, but in terms of an actual production of a chemical, you know, in a plant. You know, you really need sort of 100 megaton plants um, if you want to talk climate change. Um, but if you want like interim businesses while we electrify, you know, and we go more and more renewable. I mean, all what I'm talking about might be obsolete at some point, but we've sort of got to get through a transition if you start having bigger floods here, for example, right? Um, you know, this air turbulence thing really bothers me. I have to fly soon. <laughs> uh, you know. um, I'm joking a bit. Um, I, I, I don't know the answers, but I think that we've got to wise up on this, right? These sorts of things I've shown you, you should all be reading these things, right? Because you need that information to be able to make a case to our politicians and to become activists. I mean, we, we went on a walk for science, right? You know, and so forth. But we really got to have this knowledge so that the, the problem is our politicians don't understand science and engineering. That's why the Glenn Murray thing, we're trying to make it a model for scientist and politician. You know, he'd like me to, he wants tutorials on materials. That's fantastic, right? He sort of knows what he's talking about. He's probably the most knowledgeable and so forth, but he, he wants to know more. So in governments really need to bring in those types of people, and we've got to get it on the national. We've got to get it on the agenda. We've got to start getting it out there, right? If Canada's going to get a piece of the pie and, and so forth, we, the cement industry, I don't know if you know that. Um, um, I'm going to give you a metric. China, this, in 2016, it's one of the biggest polluters, cements and concrete, right? China used more concrete and cement last year than all of the countries combined together since the invention of cement and concrete. And you can make green cement by taking the CO2 that's emitted in the process and integrate, and we've got them in Canada, right? And integrating them into the cement to make nano calcium carbonate, which improves the mechanical properties of the cement, which means you don't need as much. <laughs> it looks like we have enough time. Anyway, that was fun, wasn't it? So, uh, <laughs> um. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Join us for a glass of wine and some food. Thank you.